When I was a little girl, my dad had a pink satin cushion with a photograph of Sam Fox on it. She was a very famous British glamour model. Her beautiful smile, her large naked breasts fascinated me. They also intimidated me because they made me question what it would mean to become a woman. When I look back, the cushion is the first thing that made me project myself into the future, my future, and into the space between my reality and the fantasy of the woman that I might become or should become. It's the first time a sneaking feeling grew that I might not measure up, literally. Today, I'd like to talk to you about that space between reality and fantasy. What grows in the space, how I've tried to illuminate it with my photography, and what I've learned. So, what do I mean by fantasy? I don't just mean sexual fantasy or pornography, although they do play a part. I mean a broader type of fantasy. Beautiful images, beautiful people. In magazine advertising, billboards, social media. Beautiful people everywhere, every day, in every medium. And what grows in the space between how we look and the beautiful images we see? Ambition, aspiration. It can be a good thing to want to improve ourselves and try harder, but it's not always a good thing. Art has often flattered the human body, but never before has the human image been so controlled and altered. Airbrushing has a huge effect on us. We're drip-fed images daily of unobtainable flawlessness. Even the models don't look like the models. Cindy Crawford once said, I wish I looked like Cindy Crawford. <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> and these days, good genes, makeup, professional lighting and airbrushing aren't enough. There are digital models, avatars on Instagram with millions of followers. Perfect bodies and perfect personas created and dreamt up on computers. Now, don't get me wrong, fantasy is lovely. Fantasy can be delicious. It's human nature to admire, to desire, and to dream. But the gap between reality and fantasy is just too wide. The extreme end of fantasy is impossible. And what's worse is that what's presented to us as reality is not reality. It's fantasy. It's a false reality, a lie. When the space between reality and fantasy gets too wide, then anxiety, unhappiness, and shame grow in it. And shame is not comfortable to live with. Through my work, I want to challenge the culture of shame and help people to feel free and happy in their bodies. Between 2013 and 2018, I photographed and interviewed 300 women and men about their bodies and their lives, specifically the taboo parts of their bodies. I turned my lens to their breasts, penises, and vulvas, and I did this to open up the deepest conversation possible about what it means to be a woman and a man, and to thoroughly destigmatize our bodies. I set out to find 100 women for an anonymous series of photographs and interviews about breasts. It took me two years to find them. It's a big thing to bear your breasts in our culture. I know because I'm in it. I asked my family and friends to take part. Most of them said no. Thank you, family and friends. I contacted uh, breast cancer support networks, breastfeeding groups, I went to lap dancing clubs. I've been known to strike up a conversation with a complete stranger on a train to ask to photograph her breasts. <laughs> I had to be shameless. So, this is what 100 women's breasts look like when they take off their tops and bras. We see breasts everywhere but they don't always look like this. I guess these aren't billboard boobs. I showed a man I know this artwork before the project went live, and he said, but they don't look like the magazines, which is the point. So what did the women think about their breasts? 
There's no singular female experience. I interviewed women who love their boobs, women who have very complicated relationships with their bodies, women who've had breast cancer, women who've breastfed, those who can't or don't want to, women from all walks of life. So I can't reduce 100 women to one simple message. But I did learn something interesting about the shame women feel about their bodies. It's often connected to being too much. Women worry about being too fat, too big, too saggy, too hairy, too bouncy, too uncontrolled, too messy, too leaky, too female. Interestingly, there's one part of a woman's body she doesn't mind being bigger, and that's often her breasts. Now, the project had an amazing reaction. One woman said, suddenly, I feel much better about my breasts now, which is exactly what I hoped for. I wish I'd seen this artwork of 100 breasts when I was growing up alongside the Sam Fox cushion, because I think that I'd have felt much better about myself. I'll let you into a little secret. My breasts had never been very important to me sexually, but after I completed this artwork, they became more erogenous. A very nice and unexpected outcome. But it correlates with observations from the work, which is that when we like our body, we're more likely to find sexual pleasure, because pleasure is about more than nerve endings. So, I'm more at peace in my skin as a woman than I ever have been before, and I think, hmm, I want to get to know men better. In some ways, bariality was a response to men, to men in my life, to male stories, and to patriarchy. But I realized I didn't know men very well, and of course I didn't, because there's still a vacuum in the narrative around men, even today. Men don't talk about their inner world in the same way as women, in general. And there's a shame in it, but it's a different kind of shame than female shame. It's the shame of not being enough. Men are under pressure to be big enough, tall enough, hung enough, laid enough, rich enough, successful enough, tough enough, man enough. But did I need to photograph penises to get to know men better? Well, believe me, I asked myself this. Um, I tapped into my own shame. <laughs> I wonder what people would think about me. Good girls don't look at 100 penises, let alone <laughs> photograph them. <laughs> and my concerns were right because among the praise for the project, I was called a whore, a pervert, a cockaholic. <laughs> Don't laugh, that one hurt. <laughs> but yes, this was the right body part, because we call a penis a manhood. It literally embodies ideas about what it means to be a man. Men don't see penises very often in real life, not straight men. The jackhammer penises of internet porn offer a very unfavorable comparison. There's underwear advertising, but those packages are digitally enhanced. <laughs> There's an unspoken etiquette of not looking in the urinals and the changing rooms. So it sounds a bit obvious now, but I had no idea how many men believe themselves to be too small or inadequate in some way, and how much that sense of inadequacy and shame bled into every aspect of their lives. One man said to me he'd spent his life feeling that his penis was too small, but if it had been bigger, he believed he would have moved in the world of men with more confidence. I hope the artwork of 100 men provides a very reassuring view of normal. Men come in all shapes and sizes. And I hope that young men especially take heart and save themselves decades of unnecessary anxiety. 
So, if the photographs smashed physical taboos, then the conversations opened up all of the social, emotional, and psychological taboos. I didn't know if men would open up to me, a woman, and honestly, I didn't know if it's my place to do this. Should I, as a woman, talk to men about manhood, let alone photograph penises? Then I remembered, <laughs> male artists have sculpted, photographed, painted, and drawn naked women for millennia, and I don't think they concern themselves with that. So yes, I did it, and they opened up in a very surprising way. There was an alchemy in the interviews that was magical. Lots of men told me they'd never spoken about all of these subjects before to anybody, friend or lover. And that was an incredible privilege, as well as a fascinating insight. Now, if I thought penises were taboo, vulvas were the next level. Vulvas are so taboo that they're virtually unmentionable. Think about the euphemisms. Lady garden. <laughs> Front, bottom. Foo-foo, privates, bits. So, I decided to photograph 100 women's vulvas. And they spoke to me about their vulvas, their vaginas, and their lives as women. I never thought I would do this. I thought I'd explored women's stories in bare reality already, thank you very much, but I hadn't, that wasn't the truth. The truth was I had to deal with my own internal self-censorship. The truth was I knew that if I committed to this work, I'd have to confront my own stories about bad sex, traumatic birth, shame, anxiety, scars, literal ones, and fierce pleasure. In short, the big stuff. So big that with this work, I had a sense of stepping out of my normal role as photographer and storyteller, and I felt myself act as a kind of midwife, helping women birth their own stories. Like I did too, because I'm in it. I wasn't sure if I'd find enough women. 100 is a really high bar. That might have been a mistake with my first book. When I pitched this idea to my publishers, they loved it, but they said, Laura, are you going to find 100 women who will let you photograph their vulva? But you know what? It was easy. It was so easy. This was the most oversubscribed project out of the three. <laughs> and that's because there was a sense that the reveal for us women was to ourselves. In manhood, men stood before me, a woman, in an anonymous, safe space, and they bared their body and their soul. We women looked at ourselves, inside and outside. So many women have no idea what's down there. Whereas cocks are front and center, if a woman wants to look at herself, it involves an awkward bum shuffle up to a mirror. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about, don't you? Or um, straddling a pocket mirror uncomfortably, or an unflattering selfie with a smartphone. <laughs> After I took their photograph, women held my camera with shaky hands, and they asked me if they were normal. So many women believed that they were abnormal or ugly in some way. Women confided in me that um, they hadn't enjoyed oral sex or didn't want to try it because they were worried about how they looked, smelled or felt. Where does this shame come from? From smooth Barbie dolls to internet porn, women are tyrannized by the ideal of a porn-perfect pink, neat vulva. Feminine hygiene aisles in supermarkets peddle us an array of products designed to make us believe that we're too hairy, too leaky, too smelly, too female. Blowjobs are ubiquitous in films, but you don't often see women receiving oral sex. It's long past time that we got familiar with what's down there. So, I'm a card-carrying feminist and a follower of Time's Up and Me Too, and yet I was stunned, stunned by the multiple stories of childhood grooming, sexual assault, 
rape, plain, bad, unsatisfactory sex, medical trauma and birth trauma that was so consistently and deftly woven into the tapestry of women's lives. Womanhood connected me with an anger I didn't feel in bare reality and manhood. I felt anger on behalf of women who'd been hurt and traumatized. As well as that, I felt delighted because it was wonderful hearing women talk about pleasure on their own terms. I admired stories of sensuality, adventure, multiple orgasms, masturbation, hot, filthy sex. In some ways, I tapped into my anger and my sexuality for the first time really deeply. I felt more powerful. Somehow, I think I started emanating a little more power. I think I started emanating a little more juiciness. I started seeing people differently. They started seeing me differently. Thrillingly, I felt my own desires and pleasures more keenly than ever before. Shame holds us all down. But shame is specifically utilized to suppress women's anger and women's sexuality, from slut shaming to female genital mutilation. Because, I believe, they make us more powerful. Having photographed all of these bodies, and interviewed hundreds of women and men over the last five years, I've come to three conclusions that I'd like to share with you today. First of all, real beauty lies in reality. Men are under pressure to be enough, big enough, tall enough, hung enough, laid enough, man enough. Women worry that they're too much, too big, too fat, too hairy, too female. Can we meet in the middle? Can we be enough, just as we are? I love fantasy as much as the next person, but we need a healthy dose of reality alongside it. And we need imagery that reminds us of the space between reality and fantasy. I believe that telling our stories is an act of giving and receiving help. There is no better way to bond than through an intimate story. Stories connect us. Like a confession over coffee, a secret spilled over wine. The photographs I took changed my relationship with my body, no doubt. But the interviews were the heart of the work, and people's stories changed me the most. I found the women in bare reality incredible. And it dawned on me if I find 100 women incredible, then surely I must be a little bit incredible too. Last but not least, let's put sex back on its fucking pedestal. Hands down, that is one of my favorite quotes from manhood. Let's do it. And let's do it by putting our real desires and our real bodies back on the pedestal. Let's reclaim manhood and womanhood on our own terms, in our own words, and in our own image. Our reality can be our fantasy. Thank you.